Good afternoon, everyone. We're excited to have you on our, I think it's, this is actually our 12th webinar series uh, conversations um, that we typically have with members of the Faith Foundation alumni community. Uh, so you're welcome, everyone. It's 4 p.m. in Lagos um, at this time. The title of today's webinar session is titled The Business Outlook for Micro, Medium, and Small Enterprises, Mid and Post COVID-19 the challenges and the opportunities. And we're excited with our guests lineup today and the conversations that we'll have. We do agree that it is challenging times and everybody um, directly and indirectly have been impacted uh, by the crisis. And one of the things that we, we seek to do in our webinar conversations is to provide a structure to how we frame our approach, our strategies as individuals and as leaders and founders and CEOs of different organizations and businesses. Um, particularly for the entrepreneurs within our alumni community who cut across um, small businesses, bigger businesses, startups, uh, people who have exper experienced entrepreneurs across different sectors. Uh, we found uh, that it's important to have a general guideline to, to, to help our entrepreneurs in terms of defining the strategies and even guiding them at this very difficult time. This particular conversation that we're having today is the Business Outlook session, which we typically have between January and February every year. In fact, this, Jan this, this year, we actually had our Business Outlook conversations in February. Um, but as you would all agree with me, the conversations then are very different from the conversations we have now. And so we thought it important to have these conversations again amid the current situation uh, that we're having. And we do hope that it will, it will be very insightful conversations for you. We had um, sent the registrations on Zoom, uh, but had oversubscribed um, as of uh, two days ago, and we're now also uh, broadcasting live on our YouTube page. So we welcome everyone who is on the Zoom chat, but we're also welcoming all those who are uh, listening and watching uh, live on the Faith Foundation YouTube page. Uh, for those who, for those particularly of the Faith Foundation entrepreneurs um, who are watching this on, on YouTube, please do send the link to your other um, colleagues and pairs within your WhatsApp group so that they can also be part of these conversations. And obviously also any entrepreneur or any individual that you think would also benefit from this conversation. Um, we will be um, only, we will not be taking any live questions. So for those who wish to ask questions, please um, use the Q&A section within the Zoom, uh, Zoom uh, application or put your comments on the comment section within the YouTube page. Uh, without much ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. The first person who is my friend and who is a friend who herself and her, her organization are friends of Faith Foundation is Neka Eze. Neka is the partner and country director for Dalberg in Nigeria, and she leads Dalberg's work in Nigeria. We've, we've worked with Dalberg for, well, for, I think, the last four years, and Dalberg, he's a very strong friend of Faith Foundation. Um, over the last couple of weeks, Dalberg has also been doing a review and assessment um, of the socioeconomic impact um, of the COVID uh, pandemic on Nigeria and also on the on enterprises and ventures in Nigeria. And she'll be providing some perspective um, based on some of the insights that they've gathered to date and giving us highlights from sectoral perspectives and all the dimensions uh, that they found out in the course of doing their analysis. So thank you very much and you're welcome, Neka. The second speaker is a very close friend um, of, of Faith Foundation also, and also um, someone who has actually facilitated and volunteered at Faith um, uh, for quite a long time. He's not been at Faith in a few years, uh, but we've had conversations about some of the previous sessions he's volunteered with. Um, he's somebody who, who I see as an expert within the space, um, very knowledgeable, um, even around strategy, around providing guidance. And his name is Rotimi Oyekomi. He has over 33 years of experience in financial services, equity investing, M&A advisory, and also leading a lot of institutions across different sectors uh, within the country. 
and he will be providing perspective on challenges, on opportunities uh, for entrepreneurial leaders, particularly those within the micro, small, and medium enterprise segment, uh, based on the business outlook perspectives that we're seeing. So we intend, as always, with our conversations for this to be very interactive. And because it is very entrepreneurial focused, um, I one of the person who can effectively and efficiently moderate this uh, conversation is none other than the president of the Faith Foundation Alumni Community, Max Menkiti, who is the CEO of Millennium Apartments and who is somebody who has had vast experiences as a serial entrepreneur within the hospitality and within the education space. So Max will be moderating um, questions uh, and with, the, with our two speakers. I know for a fact that he has gotten a lot of questions already, um, personally himself and also within certain members of the alumni community. So we intend for this to be quite an engaging one. Uh, so I would like to first of all introduce uh, Neka Eze um, to please give us a perspective of the business outlook for micro, small and medium enterprises uh, within the COVID-19 uh, COVID um, um, era. Thank you. You're welcome, Neka. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you to the Faith Foundation and to Nikkei as well for the invitation. Um, I will share my screen, so hopefully this uh, doesn't cause too many technical issues. Um, I, I think one of the things that we've said is that we do want to really understand what's going on in Nigeria, what could happen in Nigeria with regards to COVID-19. Um, one of the things that we started to do was both look at the current economic structure, the current economic situation, as well as understand what's been happening perhaps in other countries, whether that's around COVID-19 or other types of outbreaks um, like COVID-19. And then finally, try to quantify what those effects might be and put forward some solutions that might work for Nigeria with the focus on micro, small and medium enterprises given their importance in, in terms of Nigeria. Um, Dahlberg, and I'll do a quick introduction of the organization, we're a strategy consulting firm and we, we focus on what we call the world's most pressing um, development issues. And so we really wanted to take that lens as well to say, how do we think about inclusion and inclusiveness as an important driver of economic growth? Um, just confirming from Nikkei that you can see my screen very well. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, the situation, I think we're all very familiar. We had our first case in, in Nigeria a few months ago and new cases have really been rapidly uh, increasing in terms of the numbers where we're now over, you know, a thousand over 1200 cases. And, you know, I think one of the things that's quite important to note is that the pandemic is really putting a spotlight on some of the gaps that exist in our current healthcare system, as well as some of the questions around underlying inequality in the economy. And then finally, this question about um, a, a, a sort of general um, potential for a wide scale outbreak. Finally, um, you know, the other question is what is going to happen in terms of the economic impacts of the outbreak, as well as this question of the, the global markets and how they are shifting. So we're seeing oil prices decline and that of course is gonna put further stress on the Nigerian economy. And um, what we started to do is actually see how we could quantify that. And so our moderate scenario suggests a potential for a 4% reduction in GDP for 2020. And the downside scenario actually looks at a 23% reduction in GDP for 2020, which is obviously quite extreme. Now, the question is how might we be able to avoid some of these more um, aggressive scenarios, if you will. And what we've done is start to put together a framework for action. Um, which looks at what we call the usual suspects. These are things like investing in infrastructure, um, looking at high potential sectors that really will support local production, unusual suspects as we call them, and that really is looking at this inequality gap in Nigeria. Things like as well mental health risks that are gonna come from COVID-19 as we've seen in other countries. Things like endowing a fund for the arts, which oftentimes is overlooked. And then we outline what we call short term actions. These are things that are needed much more immediately, some of which are already ongoing and then medium term actions. And I think across the board, these actions are not um, necessarily done by just one group. Uh, we'll, we'll talk through some of the challenges that we see if it's just government or just private sector or just social sector. And so we will need to see more collaboration across the board. 
I'm going to spend a bit of time, so I think I'll take about 20 minutes or so, um, just talking through what we're seeing in terms of the global and Nigeria context, um, how we got to this estimation of the economic impacts of COVID-19, and then finally talk through the four areas of solutions that I, that I introduced. I think we're all relatively familiar with this, so I will gloss over this section a bit, but um, the impacts are affecting healthcare systems, significant loss of life, as well as having economic impact where there are measures that suggest 25 million jobs could be lost worldwide due to the pandemic. And of course, uh, important to Nigeria is that there has been, you know, over a 50% slump in oil prices and declining demand, which is obviously going to affect economies that focus or are based more on oil in terms of either their GDP or in terms of their foreign exchange reserves. Um, one figure that came out was China, for example, saw um, just, you know, based on just China and a few other countries being affected by COVID-19, there was a loss of $50 billion in global export revenue just in February. And so there's a question about what that looks like as the pandemic cascades, given that it is global in nature. In terms of the Nigerian healthcare system, I think there's a question about um, how prepared are we in terms of managing a wide scale outbreak. So I think one is this question about the underfunding of the system. So the chart is just showing healthcare expenditure per capita and healthcare expenditure as a percent of GDP for Nigeria and other countries um, in Africa. Um, I thought South Africa was interesting, so I wanted to, to look and see what what was causing that and you know only 47 of these dollars per capita are spent on HIV AIDS treatment um, and so really it is a lot of the other critical care and other infrastructure in terms of public health um, that that is really being spent in South Africa. I think the other thing which is quite important is that we we only have about eight hospital beds per 10,000 compared um, compared to to Italy. I am I'm seeing a lot of hands being raised unfortunately um, uh, I can't answer questions as I'm presenting, so I will try to come back to them as we go. Um, and the webinar is also not um, taking live questions, just as a reminder to those who might have joined late. Um, I think the final points are really around this question about equipment capacity. So there are estimations that Nigeria's ventilator capacity may be less than 500. And even beyond ventilators, there's really significant constraints on things like oxygen and critical care capacity more broadly. So I think there's a, a real push to figure out how can we um, close this gap in terms of healthcare in the context of COVID-19. The next challenge that we started to highlight is the one in terms of the government. So what we are showing in this chart is the projected budget for Nigeria. So this was the initial case, the sort of um, looking at $57 per barrel, um, down to really what we're looking at now, more of a worst case scenario in terms of the oil price. Um, and of course, the question then is how do we fund our budget? Because a large amount of our budget and a large amount of specifically the foreign reserves are, um, are, are, are linked to oil. Um, so there's a question about how much debt we can take on, how much more debt we might be able to take on, um, and what is going to happen in terms of our relationship with our debtors. Given both the high debt service, this is the amount of um, servicing on past debt, so almost like the interest on past debt that the government is paying, as well as what we're going to borrow to really just deal with COVID-19. So there's a big gap in terms of the revenue that we're going to expect to come from Nigeria this year versus what we're, what we're budgeting. What we wanted to look at is saying what is actually going to happen and what sectors might be more or less affected uh, during this period of time. We went back to about, I guess, five, six years ago to say what happened during the last sort of significant um, price drop in terms of oil and what sectors maybe were more cushioned in terms of the impacts. One of the things that we've noticed over time is that agriculture is quite resilient. We've seen continued growth, both in terms of the contribution of agriculture to GDP, as well as its overall sort of year on year growth rate being positive even during past recessions. And so in this chart, you're seeing in 2015, 2016, the year um, on year, you actually had significant reductions in things like industry, construction, trade, and to some extent services, 
where agriculture, this gray line, was relatively positive over that period of time. Um, I think one of the questions that we've, one of the things that we saw similarly uh, to the last um, oil price slump is that there were significant capital outflows, um, which is one in terms of the global financial markets. And then second, there were imports uh, restrictions which really did uh, affect import re reliant sectors, whether that was, for example, trade um, or construction or manufacturing that required inputs uh, from, from abroad. CBN, as you all know, has you know, released a number of um, important interventions across the board, and this is financial interventions um, that support a range of different sectors as well as starting to look at how we can consider things like loan restructuring, as well as um, the LDR rate, which will help hopefully to, to boost some, some, some lending into the economy. And uh, there, there have of course been a number of questions about is 50 billion Naira enough? Um, and some of the calculations from, I think one group of SMEs suggested that only about 1500 SMEs would really be able to access and this funding because of the, the amount um, of funding that's available. And so there's a question about how we might be able to expand some of that. The other thing to keep in mind is the response is going to be very expensive given we have a large country, we have a large economy. So public funding um, has been activated, which is great. Private funding has also been activated. So I think that's another good start. And at the social sector side, we've also seen some investments from foundations both Nigerian and international. But there are definitely limitations, particularly around the public and private spend. And then of course, the social sector has seen some reductions in endowments. And so there are some questions about what volume of investment uh, can the public sector make given the limitations I discussed and the private sector given at some point, they will start to feel the effects of the crisis in terms of their own operations. So I think one thing that's quite important is how can we collaborate across the different sectors and then really think about um, what, I, what we're calling sort of government-led and private and social sector enabled actions that can really um, help us stem the tide in terms of some of the economic impacts in addition to um, these more immediate Im impacts around COVID-19. What we've also noticed is a lot of the um, initial response, particularly from the private sector, has been much more focused around uh, what we call that like immediate healthcare impact. Um, whereas there is a question about how to expand some of the work that CBN has done in terms of the interventions to ensure that we can cover a larger portion of the, of the economy of the society. So I'll talk you through a bit our calculations around um, the economic impacts of COVID-19 and also why we think that um, the, you know, the MSMEs are the most important piece of this puzzle. Uh, so, so to start, um, MSMEs really do drive the economy. So they contribute 50% of GDP and they employ 77% of of, of people. And this is, I think, particularly heavy on the micro business side of things where they make up the vast majority of, of employers in the country. And um, I think one is to keep in mind that because of sort of challenges in terms of limited access to finance, um, these MSMEs are quite cash reliant. And so there's a question about how quickly they can recover from COVID-19 related shocks, as well as this question about how they'll be able to finance staff salaries. Um, the other challenge that they're going to face is that we're going to see decreased consumption. First, of course, is from lockdowns, which have already affected, um, you know, significantly national mobility, if you will. But beyond that, there is a pending sort of global recession that's coming that in, in past times has affected Nigeria. And that likely is going to affect consumer behavior, um, as well as, of course, this question about how much can people actually transact on a day-to-day -day basis, and that always affects MSMEs. Then finally, this question about digitization. Most people are not able to access really in terms of internet or have their businesses fully digitized. And so there's a question about how quickly businesses are able to pivot, not just for this current sort of lockdown 
or not lockdown situation, depending on the state you're in, but also um, because the lockdowns may, as we've seen in other places, be released and then you know put back um, on. And so there's a question about how businesses can pivot, whether that's digitally or in terms of their consumer base. Just a quick snapshot. This is just you know standard data on GDP. Some of the MSME contribution data, unfortunately, is quite old um, in terms of getting to the subsectors. But it, at the the more recent 2017 data from Smidan is is relatively similar at the higher level. But all I wanted to show here is you know agriculture, trade, manufacturing, very important in terms of their GDP contribution. But then on top of that, they're highly dominated by MSMEs. And so if we're going to see some of that sort of recovery, if you will, um, MSMEs are very critical in terms of, of our ability to, to recover. Um, I will only quickly present a bit the scenarios. The report should be released tomorrow. So we'll share that with you, even though I'm not gonna share the, the slides themselves. But what we're seeing is a moderate scenario, um, which suggests a, st a sort of stabilization around COVID-19, where we're able to sort of manage the increase in cases, um, hopefulness around the oil price war uh, ending in a detente, and having the currency actually recover. Uh, that way we're able to stay out of what we call sort of a very deep recession um, or a deep sort of contraction of the economy. And then our downside scenario looks at this question of the pandemic potentially continuing beyond the second half of 2020, an oil price war continuing, currency depreciation, et cetera. And I think in both scenarios, you're seeing significant challenges around managing. So one is the extent to which the government can really fund the recovery. And um, this question about how imports and exports are affected. And then this question again about, about domestic demand. So how can we, um, you know, make sure that people are able to actually transact because that's really what, what drives the economy. Uh, we did look at each of the scenarios, uh, each of the sectors, particularly with a focus on what are the businesses in each of these sectors going to feel in terms of the economic impacts. Um, I think in general, all of the sectors will be impacted, but there are a few sectors, for example, agriculture, healthcare, potentially education and transportation, which might see more moderate um, economic losses. And I think a lot of this depends on how quickly um, people get back to work, for example, um, how quickly they're able to, for example, take modes of transportation. Um, if people are shying away from spending on healthcare from a private perspective because of fears of COVID-19. So many of these sectors are going to be affected. And what we try to identify in, in the report is what's the moderate scenario look like? What's the downside scenario look like in terms of these sectors? And this was based interviews where we interviewed people from each of the different sectors trying to understand how they were already being affected and what concerns they had as they looked to later in the year. So for example, with agriculture, most people were not as concerned about this season as long as fertilizer could be urgently addressed. And of course, uh, chemicals and other inputs for later in the season. There, there was a question about that second season and if we're able, if we're going to be able to, to meet up with, um, with the production levels that we saw last year, which were quite high. In trade, I'll just give you an example of the type of maybe what we can call as hypothetical that, that could happen. So one is obviously lockdown. So what we call cash to, cash to stock traders. And these are people who really have a, a limited inventory and so are, are trading on a, on a more day-to-day -day basis. So they get cash, buy additional stock, for example. Um, one is, of course, this question of how the lockdown is going to affect their income and then really it means you'll have redu reduced income. Second, you'll have to think about uh, how you're able to really spend when your business is closed. So you might dip into your funds from your business in order to fund day-to-day -day living expenses, for example, when your store was closed for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then once you know people are able to get back to business after the lockdown's re release, I think you're still going to see a few effects. So one is you spent some of your savings and so you know you might not have as much stock second is a number of people have already been laid off or have reduced income just in the immediate term because their salaries for april weren't or won't be paid and then you know there's a question then of how can they actually buy the goods that they normally used to buy 
Then the next challenge is that producers are also feeling some challenges, right? So they're seeing some issues with importing um, products given globally imports are being affected. And they're also seeing some, some challenges with uh, transport across borders. So even though there's been a, a decision to keep the borders more open, there's a question about how well we're able to um, or how quickly we're able to cross borders given some, some sort of barriers to cross borders across the country. And then of course, the profit margin pressure is going to lead to less working capital and less income. And then again, you have a bit of a vicious, vicious cycle. And um, so I, I'd mentioned this earlier, but looked across each of the different sectors in our moderate scenario, looking at a 4% reduction base from 2019 to 2020. And then in the downside scenario, looking at a 23% reduction um, in GDP. I'm not gonna go into too much detail in terms of the calculations because I know my time is almost up in terms of <laughs> being able to talk you through the detail, but one of the things that we did slightly differently than some of the World Bank and IMF analysis is to say, look, the, the Ebola experience is very relevant and we use that to, to come up with what I call the COVID-19 scenario. So this is what happens when you have things like lockdowns, for example, that affect the economy, things like, you know, people actually getting, you know, the, the disease and how that can affect their ability to work. Um, in, in those countries, generally what we saw is that agriculture and industry were able to grow moderately in some of the countries um, and services, although it was hit in that first year, was able to recover relatively quickly across, across the countries. But what we wanted to do in addition to look at the Ebola sort of historical comparator was actually say what's actually happened in terms of our GDP during economic recessions in the past or economic slowdowns. And so we looked at data from 2009 and then from 2015 to 2017 to understand what comparators might there be. And there we saw pretty uh, limited impacts as we said on, on agriculture. So we saw some sort of potential for growth even in agriculture um, as well as I'd say in, in industry. Um, mostly coming from the 20, 2009 uh, recession example. And then in the downside scenario, it's really about which of these areas is going to be most impacted based on, again, looking at Ebola from Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and then looking at the past recessions, really looking for in which economies we saw the worst uh, performance. And so really selecting from those to say, okay, what could actually happen in Nigeria if we had the worst impact around uh, an Ebola linked comparator versus for the for the uh, recession. So now we'll quickly move to solutions and um, uh, Max, please feel free to chime in if I need to <laughs> if I need to speed up. Um, one of the things that we've we've said is that the usual suspects need to continue. And so these are the, uh, the suspects that we call sort of diversification. I think this has been and competitiveness. This has been in every you know, national plan of the last decade um, of various administrations really. Uh, so this is this question about how do we um, prioritize certain sectors? How do we um, boost the economy? How do we diversify even further outside of um, petroleum products? And this question, of course, I, I would continue to highlight is how do we do this in a much more equitable way so we can create jobs? Because in past recoveries, in past uh, sort of periods of growth, we actually had our GDP growing, but unemployment was rising and inequality was rising. So if, if we're going to do this differently, um, we have to really still focus on that. Now, power infrastructure is another usual suspect. I think everyone knows we have this challenge. We have to um, address this challenge. We have 80 million people without access to electricity in Nigeria, and we're importing you know, over $6 billion in terms of refined petroleum. So this question is, if we're having foreign exchange challenges, how do we actually address um, some of these issues? And then finally, we, we highlight a few other um, high potential sectors that, that may be of interest as we think about directing stimulus to, to certain areas. The unusual suspects here, this question is, how do we do something slightly differently? And so this is for us really about focusing on inequality and putting Nigeria a bit more on the map. 
So we talk about women, particularly both in decision making, whether that's around COVID-19 response or it's around, um, you know, in, in the boardroom, which there's been a whole range of conversations about that, but how do we actually support women's economic contributions? Because we've seen in other markets that that actually leads to increase in GDP, increase in sort of com company performance, et cetera. I think the other one is beyond women, there's a need to level the playing field for access to the intervention fund. So how do we make sure youth, ethnic minorities, um, and particularly MSMEs are, are very much included. And I think part of that is thinking about different delivery channels. And um, so we're not reinforcing exclusion that already exists. We okay. suggest a fund for the arts as well as really looking at high speed infrastructure and mental health support, which I think are, are very different than the usual suspects. And then finally, outline some short term actions and medium term actions with the idea to say, focus on food security make sure that people both can eat, but also that we're planting for this season uh, quite immediately. Think about expanding you know, credit facilities um, and looking at more innovative finance mechanisms and make sure we're able to help our SMEs to pivot and digitize. Now that the economy is starting to reopen in a way, um, how do we actually invest in digitization now so that if we need to have further lockdowns in the future, companies are able to, to really pivot. And of course, there's questions that have come up um, from a number of places around uh, encouraging continued healthcare coverage. During the Ebola outbreak, there was significant um, increase in fatalities from malaria, uh, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and other diseases because people were not seeking healthcare um, because they were afraid of getting, uh, getting Ebola or because of some of the lockdowns. So how do we make sure that that coverage continues so we don't see increases, whether that's around maternal health or under five pneumonia uh, cases or mor mortalities. Okay. And then finally, this question about planning for the future. And then I'll leave you with medium term actions, which don't have to happen now, but I think are quite important as we think about, this is not the first shock that we're going to see in Nigeria. We are going to see further shocks, whether that's health shocks or climate shocks or otherwise. And so how do we actually think about addressing these um, now rather than waiting until the next one comes? How can we actually learn from COVID-19? And then, then again, yes, we need to give more cash. We need to look at more targeted credit facilities, potentially explore monetary policy shifts, as well as you know, really understand how we can reduce our inequality and address some of these structural challenges in, their, in our economy in terms of this recovery. I think I'll end there with a thank you for, for allowing me to, to present um, some contacts there where you'll be able to see our, our report when that comes out for you tomorrow. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you very much, Neka. I mean, if we were in a live session, we would all clap. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much because your conversations really have helped to lay the foundation of uh, and the context uh, for the discussions today. And we're really looking forward to the formal um, public uh, publication of the of the reports and we'll be happy to share it with, with everyone too. Um, the insights you provided gave us a uh, perspective from the global and even from the local outlook. I really liked your um, the analysis of looking at even the experience and the learnings from Ebola, um, given that it also happened in similar contexts as we do and some of what we can expect, we may expect to happen, or some of the possible scenarios uh, during and post this crisis, looking, looking at the Ebola context, and also even giving some of some sectoral perspectives from agriculture, um, services, retail, for instance, uh, even education, and, and seeing how uh, the different scenarios may play out over time. And thank you. I, I feel like this is even a conversation that we should have ecosystem players here because even as you're looking to provide support and you're looking to enable uh, micro, small and medium enterprises and even just entrepreneurship in Nigeria as a whole, what are the different perspectives and the opportunities to be able to mitigate uh, the crisis? So thank you very much. Uh, without much ado, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Rotimi Oyekomi, to give a perspective really around, uh, particularly given the background that we have now, um, a lot of some of what Nick has said is not um, is not new, but it, it it really emphasizes even the situation and the context that we're in. Uh, quite a lot of our entrepreneurs do not have strategists or head of strategy, or they don't have the opportunity to have 
um, a large team of people that they can within their team to be able to also help to look and analyze the scenario. And that's why these conversations really are very important to us. So please let's welcome um, Rotimio Yekomi to provide guidance to us in terms of what we need to think about. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. I, I like where NECA, where NECA stopped because uh, I think that's probably a good place to start because um, you have the coronavirus, right? And right now, globally, um, there are two schools of thoughts. Uh, there's one school of thoughts that believes that this is going to just tip away. Um, there's another school of thoughts that believes that this is not going anywhere. And there's a very good chance that you know we'll have a second wave, and you'd find that the UK, Italy, um, they are actually preparing for to avoid the second wave because they believe that that's that there's a very good chance that might happen Q2, Q3, Q4. Um, what this means is that you know um, the coronavirus is not going anywhere. Mm. We're going to have to manage it the same way we're managing cholera, yellow fever, you know measles, you know, and the others. And we'll continue to find out, you know, as much as possible, you know, about the virus. And maybe eventually, maybe we'll find um, a vaccine that, that would help us. Now, with, with that in context, and when you start looking at Nigeria, uh, what is key is that you, you, you have to actually say what's driving the economy of Nigeria and what's driving even the businesses that, you know, that we have in Nigeria. You know, it's, it's you know, consumer as well as commodities. And the situation we have, Today, you know, it's a very complex situation. It's difficult for anybody uh, to give a general advice. Uh, why? Because first is you have companies at different sizes. You have micro, small, medium. Uh, you have the types of businesses they're involved in. You know, trading, service. You know, manufacturing. You have different stages where the businesses are. Whether they're startup, whether they're in the growth phase. Different types of customers. Whether they're wholesale, whether they're retail. Uh, even on the wholesale side, you know, what are you doing? Are you supplying, you know, to local materials, to companies? You know, are you importing things into the country? Um, is, it, is, it raw, is it raw materials or is it something that they can, you know, it's, it's just very complex. Um, and, and I say this so to say that there's no one, hat fit, one size fits all. There's none. Um, each one of us have to look at our businesses. Um, you know, I, I've listened to a few, a few of these, um, you know, webinars, and one of the things that is clear is, you know, you have to be able to look at um, your business in this phase, right? And I think that we're going to have, you have to be very agile. Um, the market is going to be very dynamic. Things are moving rapidly. Um, you are going to see businesses almost fill. Uh, you're going to see where some businesses have opportunities. Um, so if I look at, for example, there might be businesses, and this, by the way, is not original. It's, I got it from somebody uh, where he talked about some businesses in this period, they don't have demand and they don't have supply. And you probably say, would there be anything like that? And, you know, just think about cinema. If you have a cinema, just imagine what's going to happen. So you have a cinema, you know, you have rent paid, you have security guards there, nobody's coming and nobody's going to come for some time. You know, and so you have to, you almost like you have to start thinking, you know, what do you do with that kind of business? You know, um, you can also think about, you know, consumer finance, you know, because of the lockdown, right? People do not have jobs, right? And then you start thinking, how do you give loans to somebody who you are not even sure how he's going to be able to repay? You know, so the, the challenges that you're going to find, you know, across, across the different industries. And therefore, uh, which, which is why I said, it's important that we all, look at our individual businesses and try to focus on, you know, your business, what do you think you should do with your business? Um, you know, at the same time, um, if you think DSTV, you know, everybody's home, everybody's playing, paying their subscription. Um, um, on a lighter note, um, families are getting very close to each other. Uh, people are getting more religious, right? It's just that those are not businesses really. Uh, but at least the good thing is, you know, on the social side, you know, families are getting very close to each other. People are getting very religious. They're, they're, they're bonding every day. Um, they're having Bible studies, most likely every day. I'm having twice a day, by the way. Um, now, the, the thing is, you know, when you, when you look at the complexity of what we have, then you start saying, you know, what do you need to do? How do you plan? Because it's not, it's not one plan that's going to take you, you know, all the way. 
you have to be thinking almost like immediate plan. What do you do now, now, now? Even while this lockdown is happening, what do you do now? And then you get into almost like short term, which frankly, short term could be three months, could be less. Um, then you have your medium term, and then eventually you get into where you become you know, stable. Now, in all of this, what is most important is really, you know, how do you assess the situation of your business? You know, and you have to be very critical. You know, it's almost like if you go back and think about, and I'm, I'm sure most people watch um, CNN, you know, and you think about, and maybe even Sky, just look at Donald Trump and look at Boris, right? Two different, you know, the, the friends before, one person is, you know, almost like very optimistic. He wants to open up the country. Second person has almost died. And so he's realizing that this is serious. And so he's thinking there might be a second wave. I need to do something about it. And everybody is saying in the US, 50 something thousand deaths, it might be more. And I'm, I'm saying this because you need to be very critical in your analysis of your business and where you are, because it's very easy for you to assume, you know, almost like the best. And so I always say, always better to assume the worst and you get the best. Or even if it's not, if you don't achieve the worst, you're prepared for it. If you achieve the worst, you're prepared for it. Now, we as a, as a, as a company, as APIS partners, because I'm part of a private equity um, fund, what we've done is we actually did a survey of 3,000 companies across all spectrum. And in, the, in this year, just, just 2020, and what we found was that looking at their shareholder you know, funds, we found that the companies that have done, the industries that have done well um, in this period are healthcare, retail and consumer, tech, media and telecoms, and food and beverages. And the ones that have not done well, I'm sure that we all, we all can guess, you know, um, aerospace, banking, you know, air travel, oil and gas, insurance. Um, people will think insurance because you can look at insurance on two perspectives. Um, maybe because we don't insure a lot in Nigeria. Um, so you probably think that insurance companies are almost like getting the benefit of what's happening because uh, you insure your cars, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, the year is gone. So you, you've been on lockdown for a period. Your car is not on the road. Um, the good thing is, I think recently I saw something from Leadway where they're trying to say they probably will give people credit for the period of the lockdown, which is, which is very good customer service. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to understand that now the healthcare and all those others, their, their drop is less than 10%, which means they're almost So which means depends on which industry you're in, you have to start looking at, you know, how do you become very critical in looking at what your services are, whether you're supplying, um, you know, and whether you are manufacturing. And, you know, and I'm sure people have, a lot of people have heard about, next thing I'm gonna say, which is the possible scenarios. Um, you know, they all sound fancy, you know, the people talk about the U curve, people talk about the V curve, one of it, you know, um, there are things that are, I would say, you know, macro, but you then have to look at your own business because the fact that you have a V curve doesn't in any way means that your industry or your segment would have a V curve. So you have to look at your segment and try to understand your critical analysis. Um, how is my own segment? How is it going to play out? You know, what do we need to do? And, and it then brings me to three things that are very important that we need to do. One, I think I've mentioned, which is you need to assess your current position critically. You know, you need to understand, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the variables that are moving uh, and affecting your, your segment or your industry or your, or your vertical, um, and which is very important because that helps you to start understanding what sort of changes you need to make in the immediate term. Um, secondly, um, and for me, probably very important is liquidity planning. And, you know, because what you don't want to happen um, is to run out of cash. So whether you are in a U, U, U shape or V shape or anyone, if you don't have liquidity, you know, you are done. And so this is not even about sometimes, you know, it's almost like the example I like to give is um, if you have an act, if somebody, let me not say you, so that I don't, it's not like I'm talking to anybody and then they'll say that this religious man is talking to us and is making us. So if someone, you know, has an accident and he's, he's bleeding, 
when you take when they take you to the hospital, you know, frankly, they never ask you whether you have high blood pressure. They don't ask you whether you know, the first thing they're trying to do is stop the blood, you know, stop the bleeding. That's what they want to do first. And that's what I think every single SME should do. You need to stop the bleeding. So you need to look at how do you look at your cost? What do you need to do about your cost? And uh, what do you need to do about your cash? You know, if you have to give discount, give discount to get cash into the business. Because if you don't, you could be in serious trouble. Um, so I, I think that's, that's critical. And then the third is then you then start stabilizing and start seeing, you know, which is probably longer term, you know, how do I adapt to the realities of the market? Because we all know that, you know, the market is going to change. The, the, the way business runs is going to change. Um, so if you imagine you have, um, you know, let, let's give the example of which I use, you know, you have a cinema. If you think that your cinema is going to be up and running in one year, then you are deceiving yourself. So you have to be able to then start thinking if looking at it critically, then start saying, what can I use this place for? Or how can I go back to my landlord and say, you know, what can I reduce? You have to start doing that. Because if you don't, you know, you will run out of cash, you know, and you know, the business, the business dies. And you then have to get into a serious decision you have to take whether do I continue in this business the way it is? Do I adapt my business? You know, I'm still in the same space, but do I need to adapt it? Or do I get into where I have to get into, you know, a different business, you know, entirely? Uh, one of the things we also did as APIS, um, because, you know, like I said, APIS is a private equity fund. And one of the things we, 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 we do is because we have businesses across Africa and Asia, and we, we meet with, uh, again, uh, this is what I think most people should also be doing. You know, you need to have a critical meeting almost like on a weekly basis. You need to have a good idea of your cash flow on a weekly basis. You need to have your projections going forward on a weekly basis. You know, I know people talk about projections is monthly. You need to have it on a weekly basis. Cash is key. And so your, your, your projections has to focus on, you know, your cash spending and your cash inflow. You need to see that. Uh, and that's why I would always say, if you need to give discount, give discount just to make sure you get the cash. You need to get cash into the business. And in, in, in APIs, when we're talking to you know, entrepreneurs, and I'm talking across the globe, let me not say, across Africa and South Asia, um, one of the things we found was that, you know, a lot of people, you know, almost like you focus on um, the business development. And what, what is clear is that you need to start looking at, if, you, if you're a business that has stock, you need to start thinking about how do you sell your stock? You know, um, you, need to, you need to focus on your customers. You need to get close to your customers. What do your customers need? You know, how can you help them? Because they are also struggling, by the way. You know, so it, it's one where that relationship with your customer, you know, almost has to be strengthened. And, you know, while, you know, manufacturing for manufacturing companies, if you're in one of those, again, like I said, I think we've got a frozen screen. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. We're back. Back. We lost you there for about uh, 30 seconds. The screen got frozen. Could you just rehash last 30 seconds? You just go right over it again, please. Thank you. Uh, about okay, what, what did you hear last? So I know so I know what it is. You were saying um, something about construction. Construction? That's what I can't. <laughs> cash. Cash. You, you okay, talked about cash. Cash projections weekly on a weekly basis. You talked about yeah. also um, if you had stock, that's what you were talking about. You said if you have yeah, stock, and, you need to be close to your customers. Stock, you have to get very close to your customers to see how you can move your stock out, you know, almost like as quickly as possible. Um, it, what's important, like I said, is really how you get cash into the business. You need to get cash because without cash, you know, you could, you could, you know, there's no point having stock, you know, and then you die because then you, you, you have to fling the stock whichever way. You know, so it's important that you get very close to your customers. Um, you know, what we've done is in, in, in most of the companies that we, we, we've looked at in this, phase, in this phase of things is you actually assign almost like targets to each, each, each of your um, salespeople because you need to make sure you need to monitor it almost like on a daily basis. Um, like I said, in the short term, you do, everything has to be almost like you, you need to see everything. You need to know what everybody's doing. Uh, because it's not business as usual. 
Um, there has to be the, almost like discipline of having, you know, weekly meetings just to know what's going on. You have to have discipline of saying, what is the pipeline? And I'm saying whether it's services, whether it's manufacturing, the pipeline of your sales, because it's, it's critical. You need to almost like the targets have to be met. If they're not met, you need to know what's going on because you need to be very nimble. If you are not, um, you could easily, you know, end up where, you know, the business, the business fails. Um, uh, one of the, the, the we, we have like some rules that we, we've told, you know, our companies. Um, number one is, you know, you have to focus inwards, um, but if you focus, focus too much on inward looking, right, you probably will fail. So you need to be outward looking, you need to be looking at your customers, what your customers want, and, and you start looking at, you know, what, you, what, what can you produce? So, I mean, I've, we, I'm sure we've all heard about, you know, G now producing um, ventilators, and you probably say, why would a GE or even a General Motors? So I'm saying you have to, you have to, whichever way, you have to look at what do you have, what sort of equipment you have if you are manufacturing, you know, and how can you um, adapt it to whatever it is that you believe um, is moving. Um, you know, second is because um, the patterns are going to change going forward. You then have to start looking at how do you evolve your own, you know, relationships with your customers because it, it might not be the same again. Um, before now, you know, people are always going out, you go to companies, you go to talk to them. Question is, if things change and people don't even go to offices, question is, what do you do? So you just need to be, you just need to be very, very, um, you know, almost like focused on, you know, how do I strengthen my relationships uh, with my customers? Um, and I think we've talked, so really for me, critical things, one is liquidity, access to liquidity and the stickiness of your customers. Uh, when you have your customers, it's a lot easier for you uh, to then focus on, um, you know, what you produce after that. Now, the, the last the last comment I'm going to make is is on uh, because, like I said, a lot of SMEs are in different sectors, different segments, um, and I know that you know um, for Nigeria there are lots of things that needs to happen, and I'm talking more. I think that the government needs to focus on. Um, some very specific sectors and see how they can, you know, assist to drive things in those sectors. I think at the end of the day, private sector is going to lead the development of Nigeria. We all know it, we all talk about it, but we just never do it. And, you know, SMEs are going to be a critical part of this, essentially because um, the bigger companies are going to be there and they're going to have to get supplies from the SMEs or the SMEs are going to be able to deal with retail better than them. Um, however, for us to be competitive, uh, there are a few areas that we need to focus on as a country, uh, and I think it's it's a no-brainer when I say them. You know, edu e e energy is one. Uh, whether we talk about power, um, transportation is another one. And the reason is, you know, you can't get competitive if you know we talk about rice. And if you find that you find that you know the cost of rice is cheap, is it, relatively, you know, okay. What's actually causing the increase is actually cost of transportation. You know, we don't have roads. Um, the rails don't work. Um, I, I was talking to, you know, one of those who is on this um, economic advisory council and he says that he heard that we move like 2 million tons of goods by road. We move 10,000 tons of goods by rail and really should be the opposite. You know, so we need to do something about rail. We need to do something about road. And to be frank with you, education and health are areas where we also need to do something we need to deal with. Um, my feeling is that you know, SMEs, you know, we, we, we just have to buckle um, or tie a buckle or tie a belt or whatever it is, uh, because, you know, things are going to be very difficult. And if you look at stats from all over the world, uh, what you find is that, you know, the stats generally is that SME, a lot of SMEs are going to fail. Um, and I'm talking in developed countries. Uh, the difference between them and us is that uh, there are statistics, uh, there are records. Um, and so whether it's in the UK, whether in the US, whether in Canada, um, the government is, is subsidizing them. Uh, whereas here, there's no subsidy. Um, and the reason is there's no record of anything. Um, I, I can bet that most people who are on this call who are SMEs you know, are not, probably not paying taxes. They probably don't have tax ident identification number. And so if you even say you want to pay people, the question is, how do you reach them? Um, you know, if you look at, we say we have 200 million people. We only have 42, 43 million people who have bank accounts. Um, that's one record. Uh, but I'm sure that when you talk to Nasima, when you talk to Lagos Chamber of Commerce, when you talk to NASI, 
they tell you the number of SMEs that you have, huge numbers. And so the thing is, how do we get into a, a place where we, we have records that allows the government to be able to help uh, for us to even understand some sectors and actually be influential in how do we almost like influence um, you know, those sectors for there to be an enabling environment uh, to assist the success of our businesses. So I'll stop here. Um, I will have told Neka to continue because I knew that I was going to give her you know, some of my time, uh, but maybe uh, she'll pay me for money for it next time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rotimi. Thank you very much for picking on the conversations, really in terms of focusing around uh, what are the key things that businesses across different segments need to look at. So liquidity from a cash, uh, cash perspective, uh, stickiness with customers, who are your customers now, who may be your potential customers. Um, I think of the proverb, a bird in hand is what to in the bush. So how, if your customer still can value and pay for your products and services, how do you keep that in line with you? Uh, but also, again, looking at the opportunities that exist. Some businesses may change completely from where they are right now, uh, given some of the new demand that we're seeing around this pandemic or this crisis. What are some of the other opportunities that we see, either within our current sectors or even across and aside from it? I will go straight into inviting Max Menkiti, uh, CEO of Millennium Apartments, and also the president of our Alumni Executive Committee. I know he has quite a lot of questions to ask himself. Uh, once again, I would like to emphasize that please put all, our quest all your questions on the Q&A segment. That way it's easier for any of the guests to answer your questions, particularly if it's specific to them or any of the hosts to also direct it. For those who are live streaming on YouTube, please put your questions and your, your questions and or comments also on YouTube and we'll ensure that we also direct it uh, to, to Max. So Max, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Adenike. Thank you, Neka, and thank you, Rotimi. Fantastic presentations there. Um, when you're really engrossed, time moves very fast. Okay, so my first question is going to be to you, Neka. Um, from the records that you showed us, you, you said agriculture has proven to be quite resilient over the um, scenarios that you have looked at. Uh, the last recession that we were in before this interruption, and I think from your analysis about what happened in Ebola, um, the Ebola region, the Ebola countries. So my question is very simple and very direct. Is the same thing playing out now in Nigeria where agriculture is going to be resilient? If it is, which part of the value chain can you encourage our entrepreneurs to attack immediately? I.e., where are the low hanging fruits if agriculture is going to be one of the resilient or one of the sectors to bounce back in this mid post COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Yeah, I guess, I mean, there's a few questions in the question, so I'll try to answer each of them. Um, we did see that agriculture was very resilient as you look at the experience of um, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Um, there, part of it was because the lockdowns, at least in that first year, didn't really affect farmers in terms of any kind of mobility. It was only later on, like July, August, September, that lockdowns came in 2014 in those countries. So we were able to, in a way, avoid many of the, the sort of deep effects on the sector. And then in Nigeria, I think, you know, food is so important. Um, so I think that's part of it is that a lot of people are still subsistence farmers. And so they're able to produce what they're eating. And then those who are producing for the market who are actually selling their produce, and they're still going to be demand in part because we have such a strong domestic demand. Um, as I said earlier, this question about fertilizer, particularly where you see the lockdowns in reverse state is, is quite concerning. And so the question about how do you make sure fertilizer can actually get out across the country given most of the production capacity is actually happening in the South-South, I think is, is, is one that needs to be addressed um, before we're able to fully unlock the sector. So that's the most immediate. We heard that from all of the different stakeholders. Um, I think the next one is there's a lot of investment that's happened over the last couple of years around getting inputs into the hands of smallholder farmers. And I think the organizations, particularly I would say the more um, organized trade associations, as well as organizations, we've heard of them, the likes of Ababangona, Afex, some of these other very large scale organizations are 
ap actually able to get um, inputs into the hands of their farmers. So I think that is at least positive. I think in terms of new entrants, it's it's tricky. You do need some amount of capital to actually start up your agribusiness. And so I think one question is, are you do you have access to, to land of some kind, uh, whether it's large or small? If it's large, you might look at crops that perhaps have different types of yields than a very small plot if you're looking at a city type of production. So things like for example, fruits and vegetables are, are very interesting, particularly those that have shorter um, periods of time, but that requires land, it requires water access, and um, some amount of sort of shading. Uh, so there's so there are definitely some startup challenges with that. Um, I would actually love to hear, I don't know, Nikkei, if you want to comment a bit on what you're hearing from the agribusinesses that have been working with Fate Foundation, whether through the accelerator or otherwise in terms of if they're able to get their inputs on time and actually meet up with this season. And then I think the other question I'm having is later on, there is going to be this question about trade. Um, because one, I think people are going to be putting themselves at some amount of risk, if you will, in terms of being traders. I don't, I, I don't know if I will say go into that, <laughs> that sector, but I think it's such an important one to keep the economy moving. So a bit later down in the value chain, how, it, how are these pro produce actually going to get from uh, farms into the, into the cities, for example, and into the urban areas? So I think there's definitely an opportunity there. And then as always, I think storage will be quite important, particularly at the end of this uh, sort of harvest period. Thank you very much. Nikkei? Yeah, so to quickly come in, I think um, the part that you talked about aggregators are very important, particularly at this time. Um, a lot of our key challenges are around uh, logistics and supply chain. So logistics, supply chain, cold storage. Um, so um, the, the opportunities that we see, the gaps and the opportunities in that along the value chain is aggregators. So getting together all the stock produce and all of that from, from smallholder farmers and getting them to the market, particularly given the restrictions um, around moving around interstate travel and all of that. So that's something that we see. Definitely uh, giving our climate again, uh, cold chain storage, ability to move these goods and to also dispatch them to large chains. So a lot of the retail markets cannot open now, but you still find the spas and a lot of the large um, market, uh, large supermarkets being able to do that. So those people who can do those connections across board, uh, we, we feel that um, we feel that those are the, some of the opportunities that we see. Um, the other thing that you know you had pointed out, out in your in earlier analysis was the implication around the farming season. So a number of farmers, it's very critical now, not being able to farm, um, particularly in states around Ogun, Oyo, um, most of the northern farms in the north are not immediately affected because they were not immediately restricted by the, by the restriction of the movement, but farms within the Ogun, um, Lagos, Ogun, um, Oyo area are being impacted. So, whereas, and we can see that the rains have already come. So, we might see a potential maybe reduction in potential harvest, uh, in harvest yield and all of that. So, Again, that's why storage, that's why cold chain storage is also very important because a lot of these things also perish right off the farm too. Thank you very much, ladies. So low hanging fruits would be logistics, which is in getting the produce out to the market, I believe, um, getting them out. Also cold storage, right? We'll be building capacity for cold storage, either in transportation to reduce the volume of perishable items or the, or the percentage that are lost as perishables or just large scale cold storage where people can get them and keep them and uh, till a time where they are needed rather than just letting them go to waste. Okay, thank you very much for those answers, ladies. I'm going to come to you, sir, Mr. Rotimi. Rotimi, I'm going to come to you. Um, we talked about cash. You, you spoke a lot about cash and that's a little bit tricky um, because the best time to have planned for this is, of course, before, the, before it started, but we're all in this, and this is about the mid-COVID um, experience here. I need to ask you this. On a hypothetical um, case, let's take this. Would you advocate that businesses now, small businesses that have stock at hand, right? Be they food, fabric, whatever it is, right? Would you advocate or would you support the strategy that such firms could sell for credit 
I know you said, if you're going to give a discount, you should try and make it cash. And I know you also said that, look, you should try to get cash because cash is the lifeblood. But how about a position where people have stock that are going to age? They have stock that may not be that necessary again, given the way lifestyles are going to change in the nearest future. But they've paid for the stock. They've got them in their shops. They've got them in their stores. Would you advocate? Could you just tell us a few words about that? Would you advocate a strategy where people could sell to their customers, maybe buy one, get another one free, or sell on credit? You know, where you just try and shift your stock and hope to collect a percentage of that sometime down the future, rather than being trapped with the stock, they might expire and you might not be able to recover anything from it. What's your take on that? Okay, I, um, I hope you don't mind. Let me just make one comment first on the on the agri discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the reason I want to make a comment is because I think that, you know, Agri is so wide, right, that, you know, the comments that you made are valid, uh, but might not be valid for some parts of Agri. So it, it's important to just let people understand, because if you take, for example, cassava, whether you want to get cassava into starch, for example, if you don't process it within 48 hours, you know, the cassava starts losing its starch content. So I, I'm just saying that, so you can't, see, so there's some things you might not be able to store. Uh, I'm just saying, it, because it's important to just to say that so that you understand that. Yeah, um, Rantime, I think it's a very good point that you're highlighting. It, it really does vary by value chain. And I would very strongly suggest looking at value chains with much shorter um, sort of uh, pe harvest periods uh, between planting and harvest and so, sort of higher number of cycles that you can get through during the year. So something like cassava, if it, you know, it takes nine months before it's maturing or even longer for some varieties, that is not going to help somebody if they plant it now in terms of trying to eat, you know, in the next two or three months. So I, I completely agree with that clarification. So thank you. Now on, on, on cash, you know, um, let me be frank with you. Um, you know, just imagine you sell to people and then they fail, right? You, you have to take, that's why I said you have to take a very pessimistic position when you deal with in this situation. You have to be so pessimistic that you're saying that, do I want this stock to go out and then, you know, somebody owes me and then he fails, right? Do I want to keep it in stock and then it expires? Or do I want to be pragmatic and say, you know, maybe I need to sell 50% because I'm running out of cash, you know, I need to sell at a discount just to bring cash in. I, I tell you something, I would never in this situation sell on credit, never, never. And the reason is what you need to have is cash. That's what you need to have. You know, you can say I've sold to MTN and what happens if MTN doesn't pay in 90 days and then you fail before 90 days, you know, which means, you know, I you remember this is SME. So it's not like a big business where you're saying that, you know, there's bankruptcy, whatever, you know, you're done, that's it. So you need to, cash is too important in this, in this situation. And, you know, um, I, I, there's a story, I, and I think Nikkei has heard this story before. My daughter is graduating, right, in the US, and we had paid 50% for a hall, for a reception, right? And then there's COVID. So I go to the guy and I say, you know what, I want my money back. He says, I'll give you credit. I said, I don't want credit, I want cash. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, graduation. He, when I said I wanted cash, he then said, you know what, why don't we do this? I'll give you credit for 100%. I'm just telling you so you understand how, it, how because that's how, that's how valuable cash is. He says, I'll give you credit for 100%. So just imagine I gave him $2,500. He said he'll give me credit for 5000 all because he didn't want me to take that cash back from him. So I, I'm saying... Everybody has to understand the importance of cash. Because if you do not understand the importance of cash, so if there's any stimulus package, go and apply for it. Any, right? Obviously, don't be like the Lakers, where the US government gave them $7.8 billion or $4. something billion, and they return the saying we're not SME. You know, wherever there is, please make sure you access it. Because what is going to determine life and death is cash at this point in time. Because you need cash for you to survive. And then you need cash for you to, even if you want to change your strategy, you want to do anything, you need to have cash. 
if you have opportunity to access credit, access it. When you die, they worry about you. Don't worry, but get the cash because it can it can it can actually elongate your life, you know, to when you can survive. Thank you very much. So again, cash is king. And uh, to summarize that answer, he said it's not a good idea to sell on credit um, because your business might not be able to get credit from its own uh, <laughs> suppliers. So credit is it, it, it may not just help you. Um, go to cash. Thank you very much for that. I'll Sorry, just to you. Assume that the suppliers are not on this call, so you can also try and get credit from your suppliers. Just assume the suppliers are not on the people who are supplying you. So if you can get credit from them, get credit from them. Fantastic. So basically, stretch your cash cycle, collect as much credit as you can from your suppliers, even if they're on this platform, <laughs> and then go for cash. Also, I like what you said about the stimulus, because I still believe Nigerians in general are very skeptical about any form of money from the government. And you know who can, who can blame us, right? It's We, we don't have the history of having um, or basically the attitude around is one that the government doesn't really care if you're, if you're a small business, right? They only care when it comes to taxes. But it's quite interesting what you're saying. So please, my fellow colleagues here with businesses, anytime that you qualify for any of the stimulus intervention, go for the cash, apply. I mean, there's no point not applying, right? If you apply, you stand a chance. And if you don't apply, then it's zero chance. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to NECA. <clears throat> NECA. Again, looking at your model here, I'm very interested in your predictions, looking at some of the studies that you have done and your models. Are there any industries that have disappeared within the, the, within the model time that you examined, right? Whether you'd like to look at perhaps the Ebola countries as well. Are there any industries that disappeared because of this or because of a pandemic um, effect? If so, would you please tell us what those are? Not to raise any alarms, and that's not to say that the same thing might happen here, but we're looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? We're looking at the opportunities and we're looking at the challenges. My own desire is for every entrepreneur here to learn how to pivot. We all need to pivot, but in order to do that successfully, we need to have a very, very good grounding of what the issues we're facing are. Could you please let us know what your response to that? And uh, unmute your mic, please. Yeah, no worries. I mean, look, we didn't say any sectors were going to necessarily disappear in our analysis. Um, I think what we did pose, and it will, it is in the report, is the question about um, what's our view in terms of oil sector going forward? Uh, what can be done in terms of the oil workers, of course, the bank indebtedness to the sector, um, but how does oil actually play a role in, in the future of the economy, given the current oil price, as well as this question about how we can diversify into other places. So I think that's a big question mark. I don't think I'm the one who's going to be able to answer that for us, whether or not we will see significant reductions in that sector, for example, and shifts to things like gas, renewable energy, and other areas, um, given what we're seeing, as we know, around the oil price, at least for, for present. I'd say what we're expecting though is significant impacts around sectors like manufacturing like wholesale and retail trade and that includes things like motor vehicle repair this kind of things of course and we don't go into detail on this in the report because many other reports have covered this things like accommodation and tourism for sure are going to be impacted very significantly and i think will look very different um, in a year from now than they did before and then, of course, um, particularly air transport um, transportation. So I, in a way, it's, it's hard to say what will disappear. But for sure, um, you know, there's a lot of people. I've, I'm one of them. I'm a culprit. Do the Abuja Lagos transport by air um, for business. And I think the shift toward um, sort of digital in terms of things like this webinar, um, we've had a number of meetings over um, Microsoft Teams and other platforms. Um, Zoom and others with, with government stakeholders, with um, private companies, with many of our clients. I think there's a question about how we'll all shift in terms of our behaviors, assuming, as Rotimi mentioned, that this might go on for you know ups and downs over the course of, let's say, a year and a half. 
And so I think the changes in consumer behavior could end up being quite significant. And um, particularly, I think, because we have quite a large youth population as well. So there are people, you know, millions of people who are entering the workforce into this. Hopefully, there, some of them will be able to actually, you know, secure jobs. Um, but their behaviors are going to be significantly impacted uh, going forward. So I think we're going to see those, those sectors that are covered by the global report. So this is accommodation, tourism, and air transport for sure are going to change. Uh, we've already seen today South African Airways is essentially going into some sort of dissolution. We're seeing this happen, and that, that is for sure. I think manufacturing is also going to be heavily hit in part because of, as I, as I highlighted before, the MSME contribution, and also to some extent reliance on imports for inputs and some of the global supply chain challenges we're seeing there as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to twist that a little bit and say that industry players, or let, how would I put this? Airline industry is in trouble. I mean, we've recently heard that Richard Branson is, is basically, well, Virgin Airlines in trouble. Um, you just mentioned also the other uh, airline in, in Africa. So entrepreneurs on this program now that are watching it, if you have a business that supplies services to some of these, should I say, high risk um, companies, high risk, risk sectors, it's very critical that you learn to pivot now. And you might need to cut your losses because if, if you're still going to continue business and, and sending out stock and sending things out, there's a very high risk that a lot of, that, of those services and products might not be paid for. With that in mind, now and I'm going to use that and twist to Rotini. Rotini, I'm back to you. It's very critical when there, when there are issues. Um, people say that uh, it's in difficult times that you really know who is a good entrepreneur, right? When everything is booming and people are just consuming and everyone wants the next big thing and the next big thing, it's often very difficult to really discern who's really a good leader and who's a good entrepreneur. Now, I'm going to take this as the, as the, as the background to the question that I'm going to ask now. Now, there are issues everywhere. How would you advise the, the average MSME owner, entrepreneur to pivot? I'd like you to, to give us three steps. What are the three steps, if I could bring it just down to that, to help focus your mind in? What are the key or the first or the strongest three steps that we should be looking at or we should be um, doing in order to get us to look at our businesses separately and be able to pivot? Thank you, Rotini. Okay, let, let, me, let me start with this. By the way, I don't think any industry is going to disappear. I think what you probably would find is that you're going to find new players. I mean, let me just give one example um, again, because this is SMEs are on this call. So I don't think Virgin, uh, sorry, I don't think um, Airpiece would be on this call or Arik. But you know, the thing is, the planes are the planes. The planes have been manufactured, the planes are there, right? What's going to happen is somebody's going to fail. And somebody's probably going to buy those things for cheap, right? Whether we like it or not, people are going to travel to Abuja by air. Now it's going to mean you probably will get new players, right? You probably would find that maybe the prices will, will be affected somehow because guys who are manufacturing airline uh, planes, you know, have huge stock now. And the question is, what are they going to do about it? So you're going to find possibly uh, things are going to be maybe cheaper to buy because if you if they don't buy it, if they don't sell it, they're going to have just Stuff you know, it's very similar to what you've said um, because it's it's almost like a universal um, you know system. So it's not, it's not like it relates to just SMEs. Um, two is I think one of the biggest challenges you find today is that the the supply chain um, you know you know because the world was like one and so you know there's just ease of moving things around. Now people have found that now that you have to start thinking about your local supply chain rather than international, you know? So yeah, and that's gonna create opportunities. So it, it's really a matter of how do you, you know, um, either it's an area where you have expertise in, you know, how do you start looking at where would be these opportunities be? Um, you know, I like the example you use about, I just use one example tied to that. So um, what supply food to um, airpiece, right? Will airpiece remain? I don't know, right? For this period of time. So the question is, what's your area of specialization? What do you have? 
you have equipment to for cooking. So you then have to start looking at, you know, you know, because there's upscale, there's downscale, right? So you have to start looking at things like that to say, look, I have this. By the way, there's some things that are, like I said, some things are immediate term, short term. Whichever way, food is always going to be, you know, it's going to always have huge demand. So if if chicken licking or dominoes can last, you know, till after this, there's going to be opportunity. And so if you are, for example, if you supply food to airlines industry, you, you need to start thinking if the airlines don't take off, how do I, because you have the equipment, you know, so it's almost like, how do I start looking at a different market segment? So there are different things. So it could be you are doing the same thing to a different market segment. It could be you are producing, you are using the equipment you have. Maybe there's something else you can do with it. And that's why I said it's, it's difficult because it's complex. And when I say complex, you know, it's difficult. Each person or each industry, each company, you have to look at yourself. Because what you do and what the next person sitting next to you is doing could be completely different. So if you take an example of the cinema house, you know, the question is, what do you do, right? You know that cinema is not going to be what it is. So the question is, if you have this, what can you do? You know, it's either you know that maybe I'm dead. Let me just give up the place and just go find something else to do. Or you are looking at the hall and you're saying, what can I do with this hall? Especially knowing that there's going to be, how do you call it? Um, social distance, what do you call it? Something distancing. Yeah, social yeah. distancing. Because because there's, that's always going to be there. So the question is, you know, what sort of movies are you going to get? How many people are you going? To... So it, it, it just starts telling you that some industries, you know, are going to really really struggle and suffer, and some, frankly, are going to continue to 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 just expand. You know, payments, for example, when you start looking at, you know, payments would always be right um, because whether you're talking USSD, whether you're talking CAD, whether you're talking period. You know, there, is, there are areas where, you know, the people won't get affected, there are areas where they get affected. I'm saying where you get affected, you need to be very, very, you know, uh, pragmatic and start looking at what skills do you have? And that, that's the way I'll, I'll look at it. I'm saying what skills do you have? If you're manufacturing, what equipment do you have? What else can this do? You know, those are the things you need to start looking at because you have to be nimble. Uh, you have to be very pragmatic and look at, you know, same business, you know, related business and see what's, so it will be things that just revolve around your skills, your equipment and your resources. Thank you very much. Uh, to my fellow entrepreneurs there, you've, you've really heard that for you to pivot, you really should have a good look at your skills and then to see where else you're going to be able to, to twist into. Um, yes, Adenike. Yes, sorry, I want to also throw two questions that are on the Q&A page uh, that I, th I think that will be good for the, for the guests to answer. Um, one of those questions was around the intervention funds, and I'll direct this to Rotimi. Uh, so intervention funds are grants, are not grants, but loans with interest. Going for these funds creates your increases your liabilities, especially when you can't produce optimally and demand is low. And this becomes a challenge in the short term and even in the long term. So I think the, this was a comment question. So in terms of how does, if you, should you go for intervention funds, even if you look at your cash out or, or, or even your revenue projections, and you know that that's going to be a very difficult thing for you. So I think that's one. Um, and then for, um, for NECA, um, um, there's another question around uh, how, how can the organized private sector rally to help SMEs, especially in the agribusiness space? So we seem to have quite a lot of questions around the agribusiness space. So um, please, Roti, me answer that and then Neka answer that. Thank you. You know, my, 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 my answer is going to be very simple. Um, and, and it's simple because the question is, if you don't take it, what happens to you? Right. It, it's, it's for me. It's a very simple question. If you don't take it, what happens? You know, you have to you have to leave, right, to be able to you know take opportunities that exist. If you if you if you die, you can't take any opportunity. So you have to leave, right? And you know, we are talking about the future. You know, how things will change in the future, you don't know. So whatever what you need to do is you need to say that you know I need to be there. When I'm there. I'm able to assess the situation. I'm able to see, you know, how I can be nimble and move from one to the other. 
But if you are not there, it means you're not there. It's almost like, I think um, Mark said, uh, I think I, I might not be saying it exactly the way he put it. If you don't buy the lottery ticket, you can never win a lottery, never. Now, the fact that you buy a lottery ticket doesn't mean that you're going to win, but it means that there's a chance that you can win. And so what you want is you want to have that ability to be there when you can take advantage of opportunities, because if you don't, so to be frank with you, I tell people, unless you have something that is cheaper, I would take anything I see, right? And I'm not saying, I'm not saying 100% interest per month. And by the way, the intervention funds are not that. I would take anything I can see because the intervention funds are cheaper. And even if I don't, I will take a facility with the hope that let me continue to chase in, in intervention fund and then I can refinance it. Because if you don't have, you know, if you carry stock, you carry stock 100 million and you have 2 million. So what are you going to do? Because you, you end up, you know, you can end up going into bankruptcy and then the 100 million stock gets sold. And you know how it is. It, it, gets, it gets sold for 10 million. So you might as well make sure you get the intervention fund, see how you can, you know, be, be, be flexible, you know. And we've seen people start doing, you know, face masks with, but, you know, th these are things that you have to, you have to be, you just have to be nimble, right? And the only way you can be is you have to be alive. Yeah. If you are, that's why, that's why I give the example of the hospital. And for people who are doctors on this call, they will tell you, when you go into a hospital accident and you are bleeding, they, they don't ask you whether you have, high blood pressure. They don't, they don't ask you whether you have, the first thing is we need to stop this bleeding. And that's what you need to do. So when you stop it, that is when you can deal with high blood pressure. But if you don't stop it and you deal with high blood pressure, you die from hemorrhage. You know, so it's, it's, so for me, it's, it's, it's almost like simple question, simple answer, take it. Thank you. Thank okay, you, you had a second part question, didn't you? I didn't get to NECA, is that correct? Yeah, yeah so Please go I, ahead. Think that, I think the question which was from the Q&A is how can the organized private sector come together and support the agriculture sector? Um, I think there's three different areas. So one is what I focus more on, which is to say we have a season as we stand, which needs to be urgently addressed in terms of getting inputs into the hand of farmers and ensuring that farmers can actually move to and from their farm. And that's both farmers who like own their farms. And this is farm hands who are much more like casual laborers who might not have, for example, identification cards or passes to cross, for example, if they're going across state borders. So I think that one is, is critical and um, really coming together for that. I think the second one is to say for the export value chains, really urgently identifying where we're having production planned for this season and make sure that we have routes to export in terms of identifying those markets, whether that's in Europe, the US or China, which are going to recover in a way before Nigeria and make sure that those trade relationships are re-engaged, redeveloped so that we can still have routes to export. If we're having the delays at port that we have seen consistent, consistently over the last decade, that's going to be a significant challenge. So I think organized private sector can address that. And then finally, what I've seen some of the private sector companies doing is a lot of individual sort of transactions, if you will, in terms of donations. I think a, a much more coordinated approach could, could be helpful. We're actually supporting one of them, which is called Give Food Nigeria, which which is trying to give food.ng, which is trying to bring together different actors to say, how do we get food into the hands of people in terms of what I'm calling that food aid? So I think across those three, three areas, production of sort of staple crops, if you will, export of um, produce, and then finally this question of food aid, I think we, we need to figure out a way to come together. And I think, you know, whether or not that's through existing platforms or creating new platforms for collaboration, um, I, I agree that there is an opportunity for organized private sector to come together. And I think that's at the larger level, like if you're looking at the large FMCGs, but then that's also when you're looking at farmer associations, for example, and um, really having them band together to have those conversations with the financial service providers and others to make sure that they're able to, to use that sort of magnitude uh, to grow. 
I think the final reflection is as much as I have some significant concerns about uh, from a technology perspective two very large organizations like Apple and Google coming out to say they're going to collaborate. I think there's something to be learned about that, which is that this pandemic is, you know, a first in hundred year type of phenomenon and it's going to require different types of collaboration and working relationships to move forward. I think even in my own sector strategy consulting, you're starting to see some of that with different professional services firms thinking about how you can partner together to attack and address some of these challenges. And my hope is that we'll start to see some of that um, over time, even if it's just in an intermediate phase to, to get us to the, to the next level. And um, I think competition is important to drive sort of our medium term sustainability. Um, but I think the, the collaboration can actually help, especially in this short to medium term. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think we have quite a few questions from, from the live audiences and everyone else participating. Could yes, we take some uh, of those? Yes, I know we've started to take it. A number of them have been responded to by NECA. Okay. And, okay. Uh, also doing that. I, so I think there's some consistent questions around people in the makeup space or within businesses that are not, there's no demand at this time. And I think that you've sort of answered it in different ways to say, okay, explore. You don't necessarily have to be doing, if you, if you cannot generate any demand for what you, you do traditionally as a business, go and explore other product or service offerings. I know people now who are going into mask making and we're not even in the fashion space uh, before. So look for where the demand and the opportunities and, and, then, and, and then identify that, particularly if you need to generate interest from the person. I don't know if you also want to answer that. So there was that question. Somebody's also asking a question around um, the devaluation and that, okay, the dollar is going up now to 510 per Naira. Uh, for those that are into product importation, how can we diversify or get dollars for foreign transactions and what opportunities are available for export and how do we go about exporting? So, um, Rotimi, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll throw that question to you. The, uh, I mean, I, I'm hearing 510 for the first time, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping, that, I'm hoping that it's not 510, that it's just an exaggeration. Um, but you know the, the you know um, it's it's a big challenge you know um, it, it's probably for me one of the biggest challenges that we have, um, which is you know when the rate go, goes up like that it's an incentive for you to export, you know however for you to export right you have to you have to be competitive, because you know the question is how do you export when you are when you are not competitive, right. But the other thing that it does, by the way, also is it also protects the local market because what it means is that anything that is coming in, um, they're coming in in dollars, and so it means that their price is high. But you know, at the end of it, which is why I said the things I said, you know, about what government has to do about you know infrastructure, whether it's energy, whether it's transportation. These, these are areas where we, these are the areas that takes us away from being competitive, uh, because you know I've seen some stats about you know um, rice at you know, the gate, you know, in, I think it's Abia or something. And by the time it gets to the girls, the cost of transition is more than the cost of processing the rice. So, so I, I think it's important that, you know, if we, if we want to export, please, please, please make sure that, you know, you can meet the quality that is required. Because, and I'm saying please, please, because you might end up shipping things, you know, and then it's not accepted, you know, at the other side. So you need to you need to be very very careful about that. You know, um, long time ago I used to I used to be involved in a company that we we export um, dried dried wood, and you know there was a time we shipped like five containers and they rejected all the five containers. You know, so you just have to you and meanwhile you know remember you've paid for you paid you process you've done everything, um, and then you know you, you you start thinking how do you recall it back because it's even more expensive. So you, you eventually end up you know, just, you know, abandoning it there. So I think it's important that it's an opportunity, by the way, it's, an, it's a real opportunity for local uh, producers um, to export, uh, but it just means that you have to understand that you have to be very competitive. Um, and by the way, it also helps, you also, because the local market is, by the way, is very big um, on almost everything you can think of. Um, it might not be one that you can sell, um, you, you might have to sell almost like in smaller packs, um, rather than in, in big packs, um, but it's it's always there is a, there's a, there's a huge market here, 
and there's a huge opportunity. Uh, but let me just add something to what was said before. You know, I think you have all of this Lagos Chamber of Commerce, NASI, NASMI, MAN. You know, I think we need to take advantage of advantage yeah. of those those associations because those associations actually are able to they're able to lobby for things. Um, they 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 end up getting invited to things, and they also have within the associations they also have I think they have even maybe um, specific sectors and whatever. So I think it's important that people try to take advantage of those. Those associations, they, they, a lot of people think that, you know, even if it's not useful, right, for whatever, um, it's, it's a vehicle that gives you an opportunity to voice, you know, what you want. Um, the other thing I want to also say, and I think you mentioned it, is, you know, one of the challenges we have also is that we have a tendency uh, to like to go alone, to do things alone. And I think that we have a situation where we need to start looking at potential partnerships, you know, and collaborations. Uh, obviously not just do it because it's good, uh, do it because there's value that can be added. Um, so if, for example, um, you, you produce one thing and somebody else produce something else, why don't you see how you can come together, you know, and then you have like maybe even a finished product that can. Again, I, I'm careful not to go in, not to mention any specific thing, but I think that the principle is that, you know, partnership, you know, works, collaboration works. And it's something that I think people need to explore. Thanks. Thank so you. I think we're taking most of the questions, um, and uh, all, most of the, all the other questions have been inferred to at the point. If there are any other specific ones, we'll answer them. So over to you to round up. Please. Okay. Am I the one to round up, or in terms of, do you have any other questions, or you're you're good? At well, your... I I just want to have one, just one little one, please. Um, and this would come to Mr. Rotini. Can you confirm, and this is just my own thinking, right? Prior to COVID, the government- I cannot, I cannot confirm. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah. No, okay, you know, pre-COVID, the, the, there was, um, should I say this, there was an, an environment of, um, should I, slight aggression towards tax collection, if, if I can phrase it like that, right? Um, Mid-COVID now and post-COVID, the signs are at least positive in the sense that COVID has now made the government to start listening to businesses. At least I know in Lagos states, there have been two or three meetings where uh, members of the organized private sector, different groups have had meetings with, with, with uh, the governor and have brought out their own um, or our own challenges to them. Do you have any information about what the tax situation is? vis-a-vis -vis the regular filings that should be done and maybe penalties that normally would apply. I'm asking on behalf of all the other businesses and people that might be worried that they might not be able to make either March or April's um, submissions for obvious reasons. Okay, okay. Let, let me, I, I would, I would, I would try to answer that two ways, um, but let me take, let me just answer yours, the question you asked first. I, I think most of the Basically, everybody knows that nobody can meet any 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 timelines again now. Uh, so, for example, as you know, you cannot you cannot have an AGM, you know, on 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 video conferencing, right? But if they've, they've actually relaxed that guideline because they're saying if you don't do that, AGMs will not happen. Um, even even the banks, even the even NSC uh, is given some leeway for when people need to file, um, you know, their accounts. Uh, obviously, I mean, if, if auditors cannot go out to audit, then you know what what, what can you do? Um, you know, so there, there, there are those challenges, and I think that you know you would find that there will always be some you know um, the, the government will relax things just to make sure that. Now, the the second comment I want to make for me is actually is a very serious one, and it, it has to do with you know we we you know we have a tendency in Nigeria we complain about everything, right? By the way, I'm Nigerian, so uh, we complain about everything. We complain about the roads, we complain about the light, we complain about this, we complain about that, you know, and everything we're complaining about, there are things that, you know, we want the government to do, right? But when you then look at people and you say, are they paying taxes? We're not paying taxes, right? Um, you know, so I sit down today and, you know, you listen to them in, in, in the UK and, you know, they're able to give people money. Right. If you look at the Canada in Canada, 
they're doing the same. Look at US, they're doing the same. Now the question is, why are they doing this? And how do they get these people? They get these people because there's a record of people. So whether you're paying taxes, there's some record. And so if you look at, if I look at Canada, which I think I know fairly well, right? So they're saying, we're gonna give people who are self-employed this, you know, the question in Nigeria, who's self-employed? You don't even know. So we're talking of palliatives and you're saying, how do you distribute it? You don't know, right? You're saying, okay, so private sector is putting money together to give to people. We don't know. The only record we have today that is verified, the BVN. And by the way, BVN is just, it's just you have a bank account. You know, you know, the question is, how do we tie this into the tax record? How do we make people pay taxes? Because what's happening is that the people who pay taxes today are the ones that get, you know, hounded every day. Because so far you are in the record, they, they hound you. The people who are not there don't get hounded. So you don't get into where maybe it's better for me not to be in the tax bracket than to be there, right? But if, if we just say that as good corporate citizens, that we think it's something that we all want to do, the benefit comes to all of us. You know, so I look at Canada, for example, there's free healthcare, you know, they're giving people money. You know, why are they doing it? Because they're saying you are paying taxes. So it's almost like, ah, for paying taxes, you know what? Now there's a problem. Let's see how we can help you, right? And so there has to be a way that we as good citizens, right, decide that there's some things that we need to do. Uh, we need to pay our taxes. You know, we, you know, we just need to do things the right way because the benefits of it, you know, are more than, um, you know, if you just take what's happening now, it just take, just look at the US, look at UK, look at Canada, and look at how much the government is paying people, right? And it means right. that, it, but we need to win, but we are not there because we can't even do it. We don't even know, we don't even know who exists. We don't even know our population. We don't know how many people work. We don't know how many people are in the informal sector. We don't have a clue about anything. You know, when I see numbers and they say, oh, they're, you know, 150 million SMEs, you know, I just say, okay, because I don't believe any numbers. And so we, we need to try to find a way that we get, you know, um, things into, the, into a, a, a database that can help for planning. It's almost impossible to plan, almost impossible to plan. And it's the same with even our businesses, our small businesses. By the way, our small businesses have to go the extra length because what makes a business succeed is actually revenue, it's not cost. What makes a business succeed is revenue, not cost. So, and I'm not talking, I'm not talking now. Now you need cash. Yeah? So, but I'm saying for the long term is revenue. And the thing is we cannot afford to make assumptions like, oh, if I sell to 10%, we have to find data, even if it's not the same data that is, you know, we have to find it we can use to help us give a real estimate of what we're trying to do. You know, I see too many people just, you know, we, we don't, we, we just have a hunch that, oh, this will sell. And then we go buy equipment and then we get into it. And then maybe even not, is maybe even, you know, I look at Nikki and I say, ah, Nikki, where did you get this dress? And then she says, and I say, oh, me too, I can, I can do it. And you know, how many Nikkis are there? I don't know. But you go and buy, the, to buy everything and then you get into trouble. Sorry, Nika. Mm. <laughs> no, no worries. I mean, I think the response is very helpful. Um, I, I have a bit of perhaps a radical view on this. And I think one is you're right. We, we don't know how many people are in Nigeria, let alone whether they're Nigerians or our brothers and sisters from the region. I think that's a very big problem and we've seen it in the response already. We don't know where and how to get you know, goods out to people, even if we could cover the entire economy. So I completely agree and sort of support that point around counting. Um, I think the other challenges we have uh, to your question, Max, we have seen some relaxation around the tax side of things. So that's around corporate income tax is now shifted out to, to the end of July. Your, your, your monthly returns you can pay at the end of the month rather than the 21st, uh, et cetera. There, there have been some relaxation, but during the last recession, as you hinted at, collections increased. And you know the last reports that came out, collections have continued to increase even when we were at sort of 2% or less economic growth. So. As much as I think there is right now a little bit of forbearance, the question about whether or not that need to motivate and mobilize, sorry, further revenue 
um, counteract this balance that we need in terms of economic growth. So I think that's a big challenge. And I would continue to highlight as much as we have difficulty counting people, the only data that we do have, whether that's from the National Bureau of Statistics, that's from SMEDAN, that's from AFINA, or others strongly suggest very significant inequality in Nigeria, such that the tax base, even if, you know, let's say, I think Bate Foundation a few years ago was even if the 400,000 companies who maybe should be paying taxes do pay taxes instead of, I believe, about 100,000 who are paying, even if we're able to increase our tax base by 4x, there is a question mark about how do we really make things much more equal. And I think, unfortunately, we do not have a progressive tax system. Um, and there are significant amounts of wealth that are held by a small percent of the population. If you look at what some other countries are doing where you see significant donations from the billionaires and millionaires, I think there's a question about what we're going to be able to do to mobilize private philanthropy in addition to the public response, because we know there's significant limitations on public response, as well as even if you're looking at bringing in the private sector, who are going to be similarly affected by, by all of these challenges. So I think there's a strong push, I would say, to really look at private philanthropy and how we can encourage that and then look at over time with credible vehicles, as we highlight in our report, how do we think about that kind of redistribution and um, think about diaspora as well. Hopefully other markets are recovering from COVID directly and from the economic effects um, in advance of Nigeria and then can help to, to, to support the economy. Thank you. Okay, um, at the DK, I think we're pretty much rounding up, aren't we? Yes, we are. We are 15 minutes over our time, but I think it was an additional um, well-used 15 minutes. Um, so thank you once again uh, to NECA. Thank you very much uh, for, for your time. Thank you for presenting the highlight of your report. You, um, you formally published it, and we really do appreciate that. We look forward to getting it, and we'll share uh, we'll share around to, to all those who are interested on that. So thank you very, very much. It's always a pleasure listening to you and, and hearing uh, your analysis and insights. Uh, thank you very much, Rotimi, for giving very practical insights. You know, and that's one of the things that um, I think is very important. They're not textbook answers. They're really just this is what the situation is. These are the strategies you can explore. Um, but this is also the reality of, of, of the, of, or a guidance around you, how you can make this, this approach. Um, and I really appreciated some of your comments, even specifically around some of the sectors and the spaces and what we're looking uh, to do. Thank you, Max, as always, um, for effectively moderating. So Max moderated the first business outlook we had in Muson Center. So again, it's amazing how things can change in two, two months, two and a half months. Um, mm -hmm. seems like that was a whole lifetime ago. Thank you to everybody that joined in um, on Zoom and also to those that joined in on, on YouTube. We've done a, we tried to take a number of the questions from YouTube to answer them here. Somebody sent me a question that why am I looking at my phone? And I said, I'm actually trying to get the questions from YouTube. It's not like I was chatting privately on the side. Um, so um, once again, we'll continue with our webinar series next week. Uh, we'll send the details out uh, as usual. Um, one of the things I wanted to take from what Rotimi said is the importance of taking advantage of the chambers of commerce, the groups, Faith Foundation, um, and taking advantage of that coalition and group because a lot of us as stakeholders are pushing and working with a lot of people within the policy space and all of that to do that. Uh, much more specific ones like Lagos Chamber, Potaka Chamber, uh, who also do things, NECA, also do NESG, also do things from a sector level. For I know quite a number of our much more mature entrepreneurs are very involved at this. If you're not involved, please, this is the time to be involved. This is the time to engage. We've spoken generally. A lot of people have asked very specific questions around value chains. It's usually at those levels that you even get more details, more insights, and even opportunities. So some people are asking around funding, opportunities inside. The truth of the matter is that even when private sector comes in or development funding comes in, there's only so much funds that can go around. And sometimes, it's been positioned within these organizations that you even get first 
aspect to it uh, and all of that. Um, we also, uh, we've helped to support, I believe, uh, Fata is on the call now, over uh, almost about 200 of our alumni members to apply for the CBN 50 billion intervention fund. We even did a whole webinar session uh, about two weeks ago that we was quite interested with and a lot of our team members are ready to help and guide you through the application process. So for faith alumni members, this is only for faith alumni members though, just send an email to alumni at faithfoundation.org. I'll reach out directly to Fatai or reach out to Akiwande and they'll help you put you through the process. We also have the guideline video that we've done around how to apply this. Uh, please let's continue to keep heart and spirit and soul alive. Um, let's continue to keep ensuring that if we, if we need to go out, we use our masks, we, we, we abide by all the guidance around safety protocols because it's the person that is alive, that is healthy, that can even think of sustaining or that can sustain or, or build a business at all. So thank you once again to NECA. Thank you to me. Thank you to Max. Max, you have a last word? Yes. Okay. And I want to speak to the alumni out there. Look, as human beings, we're hardwired to feel fear. And when things happen, the fear reaction comes out very strongly. And I do understand that a lot of us are going through that same fear around our businesses now. The truth is that Max has frozen. <laughs> look through fear. So I want to encourage everyone to look through fear. The fear is going to come, but you're going to need to create and keep a mindset that allows you to look through fear to the other side to see what the opportunities are. I promise you new millionaires are going to be made in about a few months' time. New billionaires are going to be made in about a few months' time. And look, a lot of people are also be made, going to be made redundant, which means they're going to come into the entrepreneurial space just to see if they can make a living. You're already ahead of that because you're already practicing as entrepreneurs now for one, two, three, four, five years. So I implore you, don't give up. Focus on just thinking beyond the fair. Work out how you're going to pivot. This is not over yet. We may still get a second spike. Steady your mindset, apply what you're learning and by God's grace, success will be yours. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Nika. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Have a good weekend. I believe tomorrow is Labor Day. If you can, enjoy Labor Day however you can in your house. And um, take care. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, all. Bye-bye.